Ruby's story. Ivan, tell me another joke, please. Ruby begs after the two o'clock show. I think I may have run out of jokes, I admit. Another story, then, Ruby says. Aunt Stella's sleeping, and there's nothing to do. A story, then. I tap my chin, trying hard to think, but when I gaze up at the food court skylight, I'm mesmerized by the elephant-colored clouds galloping past. Ruby taps her foot impatiently. I know! I'll tell you a story, she says. A real, live, true one. Good idea, I say. What's it about? It's about me, Ruby lowers her voice. It's about me and how I fell into a hole. A big hole. Humans dug it. Bob's ears pricks up and he joins me by the window. I always enjoy a good digging story, he says. It was a big hole full of water near a village, Ruby says. I don't know why humans made it. Sometimes you just need to dig a hole for the sake of digging, Bob reflects. We were looking for food, Ruby says. My family and I, but I wandered off and I got lost and I went too close to the village. Ruby looks at me. Her eyes are wide. I was so scared when I fell into that hole. Of course you were, I say. I would have been scared too. Me too, admits Bob. And I like holes. The hole was huge. Ruby pokes her trunk between the bars and makes a big circle in the air. And guess what? She doesn't wait for the answer. The water was all the way up to my neck, and I was sure I was going to die. I shudder. What happened then, I ask? I'll tell you what happened, Bob says darkly. They captured her and put her in a box and shipped her off where she is right now, just like they did with Stella. He pauses to scratch his ears. Humans, rats, have bigger hearts. Roaches have kinder souls. Flies have... Now, Bob... Ruby interrupts. You're wrong. These humans helped me. They saw I was trapped. They grabbed ropes and they made hoops around my neck and my tummy and the whole entire village helped. Even the little kids and the grandmas and grandpas and all of them pulled and pulled and pulled. Ruby stops. Her lashes are wet and I know she must be remembering the terrible feeling that day. And they saved me, she finishes in a whisper. Bob blinks. They saved you, he repeated. When I finally was out, everyone cheered, Ruby says. And the children fed me fruit. And then all those humans led me back to my family. It took a whole day to find them. No way, Bob says doubtfully. It's true, Ruby says. Every word. Of course it's true, I say. I heard rescue stories like that before. It's Stella's voice. She sounds very weary. Slowly, she makes her way over to Ruby. Humans can surprise you sometimes. An unpredictable species, Homo sapiens. Bob looks unconvinced. But Ruby's here now, he points out. If humans are so swell, who did that to her? I send Bob a grumpy look. Sometimes he just doesn't know how to keep quiet. Ruby swallows, and I'm afraid she's going to cry, but then she speaks, and her voice is strong. Bad humans killed my family, and bad humans sent me here. But that day, in that hole, it was humans who saved me. Ruby leans her head against Stella's shoulders. Those humans were good humans. It doesn't make any sense, Bob says. I just don't understand them, and I never will. Well, you're not alone, I say. I turn my gaze back to the racing gray clouds. A hit. Stella's foot hurt too much for her to do any hard tricks for the two o'clock show. Instead, Max pulls her, limping, into the ring. When she tracks the circle in the sawdust, Ruby clings to her like a shadow. Ruby's eyes go wide and with snickers, jumps on Stella's back, and then leaps onto her head. At the four o'clock show, Stella can only get as far as the entrance of the ring. Ruby refuses to leave her side. At the 7 o'clock show, Stella, in her domain, when Matt comes from Ruby, Stella whispers something to in her ear. Ruby looks at her pleadingly, but after a moment, she follows Mac to the ring. Ruby stands alone. The bright lights make her blink. She flaps her ears. She makes her tiny trumpet sound. 
The humans stop eating their popcorn. They coo and they clap. Ruby's a hit. I don't know whether to be happy or to be sad. Worry. When Julia arrives after the show, she brings three thick books, one pencil, and something she calls magic markers. Here, Ivan, she says, and she glides, slides two magic markers into a piece of paper into my domain. I like the sundown colors red and purple, but I don't feel like coloring. I'm worried about Stella. All evening, she's been quiet. She hasn't eaten a bit of her dinner. Julia follows my gaze. Where's Stella anyways, she asks. Then she goes to Stella's gate. Ruby extends her trunk, and Julia pats it. Hi, baby, she says. Is Stella all right? Stella is lying in a pile of dirty hay. Her breath is ragged. Dad, Julia calls. Can you come here a minute? George sets aside his mop. Do you think she's okay, Dad? Julia asks. Look at the way she's breathing. Can we call Mac? I think there's something really wrong with her. He must know about her. George rubs his chin. He always knows, but a vet costs money, Jules. Please, Julia's eyes were wet. Call him, Dad. George gazes at Stella. He puts his hand on his hip and sighs, and he calls Mac. I can't hear all the words, but I can see George's lips tightening into a grim line. Gorilla expressions and human expressions are a lot alike. Mac says the vet's coming in the morning if Stella's not any better, he tells Julia. He says he's not going to let her die on him, not after all the money he's put into her. George asks Julia to... George strokes Julia's hair. She'll be all right. She's a tough old girl. Julia sits by Stella's domain until it's time to go home. She doesn't do her homework. She doesn't even draw. The promise. My domain gleams in the moonlight when I wake up to the sound of Stella's call. Ivan? Stella says in a hoarse whisper. Ivan! I'm here, Stella. I sit up abruptly. And Bob topples off my stomach. I run to the window. I can see Ruby next to Stella sleeping soundly. Ivan, I want you to promise me something, Stella says. Anything, I say. I've never asked for a promise before. Because promises are forever. And forever is unusually long time, especially when you're in a cage. Domain, I correct her. All right, domain, she agrees. I straighten my f- up to my full height. I promise, Stella, I say in a voice like my father's. But you haven't even heard what I'm asking yet, she says. And she closes her eyes for a moment. Her great sh- chest shudders. Well, I promise anyway. Stella doesn't say anything for a long time. Never mind, she finally says. I don't know what I was thinking. The pain is making me addled. Ruby stirs, her trunk moves as if she's reaching for something that isn't there. When I say the words, they surprise me. You want me to take care of Ruby, don't you? Stella nods a small gesture, and it makes her wince. If she could have a life that's that's different from mine, she needs a safe place, Ivan. Not, not here, I say. It would be easier to promise to stop eating or to stop breathing, or to stop being a gorilla. I promise, Stella, I say. I promise it on my word as a silverback. Knowing before Mac, before Bob, and even before Ruby, I know that Stella's gone. I know it the way you know it. When the summer is over and the winter is on its way, you just know. Stella once teased me that elephants are superior because they feel more joy and more grief than apes. Your gorilla hearts are made of ice, Ivan, she used to say, with her eyes glittering. Ours are made of fire. But right now, I would give all the yogurt raisins in the world for my heart to be made of ice. Five men. Bob heard from a rat, a reliable sort, that they tossed Stella's body into a garbage truck. It took five men and a forklift. Comfort. All day, all day I try to comfort Ruby, but what can I say? That Stella had a good, happy life? That she lived as she was meant to live? That she died with those who loved her most nearby? At least the last one's true. Crying, Julia cries all evening while her father sweeps and mops and dusts and cleans the toilets. 
When George sees Mac, he runs over to him. I can only hear the words, Vet should have wrong. Mac shrugs, his shoulders droop. He leaves without a word. When George wipes his fingerprints off my glass, his cheeks are wet. He doesn't meet my eyes. The one and only Ivan. When all the humans have left, I send Bob to check on Ruby. How is she? I ask when he returns. She was shivering, Bob says. I tried to cover her with hay. I told her not to worry because you were going to save her. I glare at him. You told her that? You promised, Stella. Bob lowers his head. I wanted to make her, the kid feel better. Ugh, I should not have made that promise, Bob. I just wanted... I point to Stella's domain, and for a moment it seems like I've forgotten how to breathe. I wanted to make Stella happy, I guess, but I can't save Ruby. I can't even save myself. So I flop onto my back. The cement is always cold, but tonight it actually hurts. Bob leaps onto my belly. You are the one and only Ivan, he says. Mighty Silverback. He licks my chin, and he's not even checking for leftovers. Say it, Bob commands. I look away. Say it, Ivan. I don't answer, so Bob licks my nose until I can't stand it any longer. Okay, I'm in the one and only Ivan, I mutter. And don't you forget it, he says. When I gaze at the food cart, food court skylight, the moon Stella loved is shrouded in clouds. Once upon a time... All night, Ruby moans and sniffles, and I pace in my domain. I don't want to fall asleep in case she needs something. Ivan, Bob says gently, get some sleep, please, for your sake, well, and for mine. Bob can't sleep unless he's on my stomach. I hear stirring, Ivan. Ivan? Ruby calls. I rush to my window. Ruby, are you all right? I miss Aunt Stella, Ruby sobs, and I miss my mom and my sisters and my aunts and my cousins, too. I know, I say, because that's all I can think of to say. Ruby sniffles. I can't sleep. Do you know any stories the way Aunt Stella did? Ooh, not really, I admit. Stories were Stella specially. Tell me a story about when you were little, Ruby pleads. And she puts her trunk between the bars. Please, Ivan. So I scratch the back of my head. <sighs> I don't remember things, Ruby, I admit. It's true, Bob says, trying to be helpful. Ivan has a terrible memory. He is the opposite of an elephant. Ruby lets out a long, shivery breath. <sighs> oh, well, that's okay. Night, Ivan. Night, Bob. I listen to Ruby's soft sobs for a horribly long time. Then I hear myself saying, Once upon a time, there was a gorilla named Ivan. And slowly and deliberately, I try to remember. <laughs>